Hey, everybody. We'll get started in just a few minutes. I posted a link to our agenda in the chat. If you could sign in and add any uh, opens, that would be super groovy. Get started in a couple minutes after the hour. I was on mute. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, please sign in on the agenda. Let us know if you have any opens you want to talk about. and We'll get started in just a minute. That is a pretty awesome cat house you have back there, Vicki. For some pretty awesome cats. Nice. You know, that's my folks sent that for their grand kittens. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and even better, Madison, there's a park right outside and some really, really tall cherry trees. Um, and so the cats like to sit there and watch the dogs and the squirrels and the birds. And sometimes when they're lucky, they get crows. And who doesn't love watching a great big chicken walking around out there? Oh, that's awesome. I have a, a transparent bird feeder on my glass door so they can see all of the birds. It's awesome. <laughs> oh man, it's like kitty cable, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, dating myself. We don't do cable anymore. We've cut the cable. If we're lucky, they'll come join us during this call if I leave my camera on. All righty, team, I posted a link to our agenda. If you could sign in if you hadn't, if you have any opens you'd like to add, please do so. Uh, first off, do we have anyone who would like to help take notes today? Super important job. Oh, thank you, Vicki. Really appreciate I will, help. You doing that. I will need an assist. So everyone in the pool, if you could, please. Everybody's welcome to help take notes. Uh, welcome to the June 1st edition of the best working group within the OpenSSF, the Vulnerability Disclosures Working Group. Uh, do we have anyone here today that is new to the group that wanted to say hello and uh, introduce yourself to your new group of friends? Hi, Krob. Sorry, the system has taken my daughter's name. Maybe she joined the school <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> she loves vulnerability disclosure. <laughs> Long time no see. How are you, Krob? I'm doing very well. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yogesh Mittal. Ignore my daughter's name there. Uh, I work at Red Hat. Uh, I'm part of incident response team at Red Hat. And... We just recently got uh, some some changes within Red Hat, the organization changes within product security. And my role is towards vulnerability management piece within Red Hat. And uh, I came to know about this group very late, uh, two weeks back. Uh, I missed the bus, obviously, because I saw the notes. You guys discussed a lots of things and you got some quite good plans. So I'm trying to catch up, uh, getting on board. And if there is anything from Red Hat Wise, please feel free to let me know how I can help. Now is a great time to jump on board the train. Well, welcome, Yogesh. Uh, Thank you. Any other new friends that wanted to say hello and introduce themselves? 
Hi, folks, and this is uh, apologies, uh, camera wise. I'm in the middle of traveling now, but I just want to say hello to everyone. This is Alex Casada with Wipro, and uh, I see my my colleague here, Vicky, is also uh, on the line. So nice to see you. But uh, I'm part of the cybersecurity risk services. Uh, just kind of uh, been been looking at some of these uh, different work groups, and very interested to contribute along the way. So thank you. So welcome, Alex. Glad to have you. Anyone else wanted to introduce themselves? Okie dokie. Um, first off, before we get to the opens, I wanted to talk more about the uh, open source mobilization plan that we discussed uh, two weeks back. And hopefully, Everybody's had an opportunity to read the whole document. Has that, uh, has everyone had a chance to read the doc yet? I know Vicki has. <laughs> and Jennifer too. <laughs> Most of it. Awesome. So my uh, proposal for this group, there are two sections that very directly, I feel, intersect with our work here, uh, streams five and six. And there's other little bits and pieces here and there throughout the rest of the plan. But I think streams five and six are most directly related to our work here. So I was curious to hear the group's opinion on if this is something we were interested that a subset, all of us or a subset of us were interested in uh, tackling and trying to refine more and create a special interest group underneath uh, this working group. So I will uh, open the floor for comments and ideas. Uh, Vicki. One SIG or one SIG each? Uh, that's an excellent question to be debated and uh, worked through. Pro, forgive me. I joined, as you said, you know, create a working group for a thing, but you didn't stay. I didn't, I missed the, like, the topic right. of the SIG at the very beginning. Can you repeat? Yes. Can you repeat yes. that thing again? The thing would be, and I'll post a link to the mobilization plan into the uh, Zoom chat, but the OpenSSF, a couple of us went to Washington and talked to some very nice people from the U.S. government, and we proposed a 10-point plan to uh, help address some of the gaps in um, the open source ecosystem security. And two of those points, um, I think, are very related to this group. Uh, stream five is the creation of an open source security um, incident response team on some level. And I think that idea needs a lot of conversation to kind of uh, suss out what that might look like and how it might interact with the community. And then uh, stream six is around vulnerability, disclosure, discovery, and uh, essentially kind of putting some of our uh, guides into practice around CVD. So I, I don't know, uh, open to conversation on either way. We could have um, a SIG potentially for each of those ideas, um, maybe the uh, stream six is just something we do kind of business as usual. Um, stream five, I feel, is going to need a lot of focused effort up front to talk through and really kind of uh, shape the plan into something that's more actionable than it currently is. But uh, again, let's talk about it. So I'll start. Uh, re regarding uh, stream five, uh, the incident response. Um, so I might be able to help facilitate um, someone who has um, a CDO for a company that does uh, incident response as a service to maybe uh, talk about some of the challenges and maybe kind of direct uh, or focus on some of the key points that we want to address if we want to create like an open source uh, platform or, or structure for incident response. Thank you. I think that would be a very useful contact. So, and uh, my intention is if we feel this is something we want to move forward with, I would reach out to several members within the community 
Um, see if we can get representatives from like uh, the Kubes or OpenStack team to come talk to this group to kind of help shape that opinion. Um, I was going to reach out to Solar Designer, who helps manage a lot of the uh, behind the scenes mailing lists and kind of get his uh, thoughts and feelings and reach out to some community members as well. But I think that's an excellent suggestion, Yokem. Is the group, is anyone in the group opposed to the idea? of some subset of us working as part affiliation with this group on um, these streams. Crickets is a good thing. All right. So much like uh, my favorite working group, the developer best practices working group, um, I will create a doodle and send to this mailing list and if anyone is interested, please uh, sign up, express your interest in a time, and we'll see if we can find uh, something that is uh, geographically, geographically compatible with a lot of us. And uh, some of us will kind of get together to start to hammer out some of these details. And then we'll report back to this group periodically. Uh, any further thoughts or conversations on that? This is Jennifer. Maybe one thing that I would share is, um, so the mobilization plan that came forward, um, you know, it, it kind of originated in the governing board and a lot of us put this together. Um, it happened over a very short period of time. <laughs> um, and I'll just to level set and maybe like call out um, the elephant in the room. I mean, I sketched out most of uh number five and realistically it has not even close to had the input that it really needs um so for anyone that would like to critique it suggest new directions for it help us make it much better than what it is right now that's extremely welcome and encouraged and i hope you'll sign up on on crobe's um doodle because realistically this was like a couple of people um from the governing board and adjacent trying to like sketch something out pretty quickly because we knew we wanted the concept of this to be floated but realistically like there's so many improvements that can be made and it's so much in its infancy as it's sketched right now, um, that if you can come and bring suggestions, bring critiques, bring your favorite contacts, whatever you've got, um, please do. And none of us that wrote draft one will be at all offended because it, there's definitely areas for improvement. Um, so we definitely welcome, welcome all of that. Yeah, and I'll, um, I don't know if you were on the call the last time, Jennifer, but uh, because I had such uh, vigorous feedback on the original draft, uh, Mr. Bellendorf appointed me the facilitator for the DC uh, Stream 5 meeting. And of the folks in the room, in general, the group thought it, the idea had merit and they wanted to move forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, everyone agreed it's very rough, but yeah. at least in principle, uh, there are folks that are expressed, uh, they wanted to help out to try to help refine and make this a reality. That's super cool. I look forward to getting on board with what you're doing, Crow. Thanks so much. Any other thoughts or comments on creating a new SIG or SIGs? And um, just so I don't know if I mentioned last time, the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee that oversees the working groups, we're in the middle of refining some of the structure of how and processes of how the foundation works. And we used to, old Crobe from two months ago would refer to this as a project that we would work on together. Um, but uh, the new nomenclature is this would be called a special interest group uh, per kind of the new direction. So it's just uh, a little bit of a name change. It's just a, a group of friends getting together, trying to figure out and solve a problem. All right, I see, and, and I, I'm very excited about this. Uh, Emily has an open that she wanted to share with the group that I am super excited about. Uh, Emily, are you uh, eager and able to talk about the news? 
So actually, it's Eric. I've oh. been up there. I was I, I communicated with Emily about the oh. next meeting. So uh, she's good to go for next time. Um, I guess I should have put in that little thing. I also didn't know if this is the sort of thing you meant, Crub, by open. So I just put it here because okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So she's she's fine to meet uh, with the group next time, uh, June fifteenth, and I. I thought what you were looking for was some sort of like a little demonstration and or answer questions. Does that sound good? That sounds that's what, perfect. So to provide that's everyone- she, That's what she agreed to. So that's what you're going to get. <laughs> Excellent. So to provide everybody context, um, the folks at CERT CC, um, the Software Engineering Institute, I don't know exactly where it- Yeah, that's right. So we're, we're in, yeah, we're in the SEI, um, yeah. but yeah, CERT CC but, is our little group. Yeah. So there's a group of folks and um, Emily is the developer created a tool called Vince that is used for helping coordinate uh, vulnerabilities. Um, it's pretty heavily used within the vendor ecosystem. And uh, we thought it was, we had a presentation a long time ago talking about it and they have finally open sourced the code for Vince. So this is potentially a, a platform that we could um, leverage in trying to like, for example, uh, empowering stream five to contact people. Uh, so uh, the folks at uh, SEI have generously uh, volunteered to come in and talk about it and they've open sourced this tool. And it's something that we potentially could use and possibly even contribute to to make better. So we're gonna get a little demonstration in a couple of weeks. I'm super excited about that. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm happy to convey anything else to her ahead of, ahead of time if you want me to, uh, including contact info or something if you want to do it directly. But I'm I'm also happy to intermediate and tell her what you want her to know beforehand. <laughs> cool. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. We're yeah, very sure. excited about that. Yep, sounds good. All right. Do we have any other opens before we move on to our guide project? All righty. Let us turn our attention to the vulnerability disclosure guide for finders coordinating with open source projects. Addison and I were going to take a crack at this uh, on Friday, but then I realized I had Friday off. So, <laughs> um, uh, we touched it. We did a couple hours on it last week, and yeah, didn't get much further. Or didn't get much further than that. So, do we want to uh, scroll through the guide? Do we have any particular topics we want to collaborate on together? Uh, does anyone have any questions about the status of the guide? I still need to get back to uh, finishing my review of it. Um, it's been a to-do item that unfortunately just keeps getting bumped every day as other things come up um, and apologies for that, but I know you all understand. Yes, absolutely. And, and we, we love love feedback. Um, by no means do I want me and Jonathan to be the only ones that have reviewed and worked on this. So I'm super appreciative of any feedback. Um, a lot of sections are still very work in progress. So if you see anything that like looks like it's unfinished, that's probably because it is <laughs> unfinished. Yeah. So feel, please feel free to note that. Um, we're, there was a bunch of those written and it was like a copy and paste from the old doc. And so I've been yeah. like, this does not make any sense in the context of a reporter. So uh, we've been hacking and slashing and slashing and ripping and pulling it and uh, rewriting it for that. So, but yes, we haven't gotten through all of that. That's why if you read down towards the bottom, it's like, this seems like it's written for a different audience because it is written for a different audience. Yeah. yeah. And isn't that always the way that the like top half of a document is great and then the bottom half is like yeah here be dragons sort yeah of thing. yeah so i had the great opportunity today to have unscheduled time so i went through and provided uh, some feedback um my first point of feedback i think we should talk about now um while my conference persona loves all the memes I think as a semi-official document, um, it's not 
my suggested direction for how to take this. I think if we're going to go out and evangelize it, that's cool. Um, but I think as a, a official document, it is not my preferred method of uh, enhancing the content. I agree. <laughs> they are funny. I mean, they'd be good in presentations and stuff, but. Super funny. It's exactly yes. how I deliver conference presentations, but. I, I have a, <laughs> yeah, I, I respect the perspective. I also know that as a reader, I have ADHD. I would like to write, I'm trying to write a document that I would want to read. And so um, uh, that's the mindset that I'm going into this with is like, I would like to make this something that is memorable, that is valid. Like it's, it's not a block of just text, right? Because I'm going to look at a guide like this that has just a wall of text. I'm going to skim it and not care, right? If there's something entertaining to it, I'm gonna invest the time to sit down and actually read through it as a security researcher. That's the 10 cents that I am kind of coming at it from. And that's why I made the intentional decision to say, okay, like I'm gonna write this the way that I would wanna read, like a document as a security researcher, who's, you know, there's tons of things that I can read all of the internet. All right, why do I wanna sit down and read this one? Oh, this looks entertaining. Uh, Vicky. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of walk the line between the two because I agree that memes are maybe not the best thing. And I haven't seen the memes since they were added. Um, I do know that if they're animated GIFs, um, as much as I love them, um, being a Twitter native, uh, they're going to distract me ridiculously. Anything moving on the screen and I'm right there and I'm not paying attention to the word. So that's going to be a problem. Um, so um, I also think that they're not especially professional. Um, I don't know that that's really a problem. I think perhaps uh, to make it more, so I'm gonna put on my book editor hat here. Um, we can change the language to make it more accessible. We can add diagrams to make it more accessible. We can add um, pieces of artwork to make it more accessible. Things that don't move, um, you know, XKCD if it's appropriately, um, uh, cited because it is CC uh, by NC, I believe, um, you know, those sorts of things. We can do that, um, but perhaps not memes. So kind of split the difference between stuffy academic bullshit that nobody wants to spend an hour reading, um, which I don't think we've actually hit with our work. 51 so page plan. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't pointing any fingers, but since we already did. No, no, no. Um, and then, you know, uh, highly uh, uh, casual sort of thing, you know, split that difference in there. Um, so be uh, serious about the content, but perhaps be uh, casual in the way we present it. So um, I'm sure when I see the memes, I might have some thoughts about that and recommendations for how to shift it, but I, I probably don't think memes are specifically the right thing, but maybe there's a way we can do something with that idea. So I'm, I'm with Jonathan, want to make it easy for people to actually get through the damn thing. Um, but we also want them to remember the content and not the memes, right? And that's part of the problem with the memes. And that's why really you shouldn't be putting too many of those on your screen when you are presenting because everyone's trying to figure out what the meme means and they're not listening to you. So you have to consider your audience's needs. Um, and so that's too many words. This is why I have an editor. Yeah, and, and there's also some potential legal issues we would have to consult with. Uh, on copyright. Some of the images and copyright potential. So not having them, having a, a drawing or a diagram might potentially serve us better because there would be potentially no legal uh, complications. That is a good point. And sometimes they don't age well, depending on what the people in the meme do in real life. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's one potentially controversial figure in the document. I thought it was funny, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I, yeah, I, in hindsight, but yes, I, yeah. Can you leave them there till I have a chance to see them and laugh at them? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> 
All right, any other um, thoughts about the graphics or uh, comments on the document we want to dive into? So just in general, does the Open Source Security Foundation have a tech editor or is that us? Like basically, you know, an outside person that can read it, polish it up, things like that. David, are you able to comment on that? Well, Linux Foundation has a lot of resources um, on, on that front. Um, so I know that they have some that we can probably leverage, but we should also beta test it with some external readers. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we, the LF, do have tech editors and so on. I'll, I, this seems like the sort of question that I should know the answer to, but I'll be honest, I don't. <laughs> so, uh, but but we have some folks, I, I think the answer is we, ha we have tech editors, uh, they're pretty busy, so we probably shouldn't overwhelm them, uh, but uh, I probably have to get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. That's, that's good to know. Yeah, but I, I think the reality, though, is that we, you know, the, the tech editors can help, but uh, they can't uh, create silk purses from sow's ears. So it needs to be, you know, sort of decent shape to start with. Uh, you know, yeah, they can help make it clear what you're saying, but they can't decide what you're going to say. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking long term, you know, when the document is more in a uh, final state. Yeah, I suspect the answer is yes, <laughs> but I don't. I should double check first. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, David, whenever you look into that, would you be able to, assuming that having a tech editor review this is an option that we have available to us, can you find out how long they would need to review this, basically, so we can try to get, uh, I think our goal is to have this done by August, but I assume we would need it sooner for a tech review at the very least and to have other reviews. Yes. <laughs> so some news about our goal. Um, <laughs> Yes, we do have the goal. We, we were hoping to get this done to announce at uh, Black Hat. Uh, sadly, my proposal for the uh, call for papers was uh, politely declined. So we don't have that necessarily as a hard deadline. I still would like to keep to that if we can, but we don't have a, uh, a platform at Black Hat at least to uh, share more information about this. But that doesn't mean we couldn't still uh, synchronize with it. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, is there two questions? Uh, uh, Black, besides closed, there's Black at EU, potentially to throw it at. Um, the other question, I just did a little, I mean, light digging. Uh, for the topic of copyright, it's uh, it's fair use if it's used in an education context in for by non profit and the Linux Foundation is a non profit and uh, it's in a, in the context of an education and also parity. So it, it, I would still run it by the LF's lawyer. That's oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it it kind of depends upon uh, whose copyright toes. I I spend way too much time in the copyright world. Well, whose copyright toes are you going to step on? Right. Um, um, if, if it, exactly <laughs> that's yeah. the one you got to worry play with about the, play um, with the mouse yeah good good time yeah um yeah and as far as editors um i've worked with technical editors for other uh sub foundations of lf so i know they're there um and how much attention you can get from them really depends upon their workload at that time um but madison's question of how much lead time is always a respectful one right and something we should certainly keep in mind um, but now that we've got a little more flexible date, maybe that can help us a bit. And, and we also need to get in the queue of the um, OpenSSF's marketing director now to, to uh, once we are more solid on it and have a little bit better idea of exactly when we're ready to kind of get on uh, her plate so that we can, uh, that committee's plate, so that they can figure out how they, the foundation wants to advertise it. Yeah, does LF have brand guidelines and like a kind of voice creative? Yes. Well, they have generally 
uh, trademark guidelines for these sorts of things, but voice is a lot more uh, flexible. Um, uh, they don't have specific brand guidelines and OpenSSF doesn't at all yet because uh, we only just got our marketing directive, yay, um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it would be great to have her uh, show up to a call at some point in the next month or so to kind of, you know, introduce herself and hear what we're up to. And so she can kind of work it into her long-term plans. It's a great idea. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, thank you. So other uh, comments about the document, anyone have any uh, uh, objections or suggestions to the content that exists, or has anyone spotted anything that is a big gap yet? Just the question. So at the beginning, it looks like the title is for finders, but then at the end, it looks like it's for maintainers. Uh, That's a copy we... and paste artifact. This, yeah, okay. this, this is the, the thing that I was talking about earlier on where this is copy and pasted, and then like if the bottom half of the document has not been rewritten for the consumer of being the vulnerability reporter. Oh, Madison. One uh, question that I had while we were writing it that I added as a comment, but I wanted to bring up to the larger group. It seems like having a, a glossary could be helpful. Um, and it seems like we could have a lot of words from the first guide that could be helpful too. So there were some things that were defined there, a lot of things that were defining here too. And I'm realizing like adding the definitions in the text uh, can be a little much, I think. So like having, I think just a glossary maybe for this whole working group that we can use like across all of these documents that we're making would be super helpful. And then we can just reference like hyperlink them in it. It'll be super great. <laughs> we have a can very convenient a document folder in our Git repo that we could leverage for that. Awesome. Yeah, I have a plus 10 on that. That's such a great idea. Yeah, I think that's, a, it was, I am sad I hadn't thought of it, but that was an excellent idea, Madison. Yeah, I realized that we were like defining the same term in both places. So it, it made sense to do it in the first doc, right? Because that was all there was at the time. But as we're developing more documents, I think having a single glossary can probably make more sense. So I'm happy to start putting stuff there as we're working on this, if we are okay with that. Yes. David. Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask tech editor how long it would take to review the doc. Um, it looks like we're shooting for under 20 pages. Is that Yes. Just looking at what we've got here. That feels right. Like what are we like at currently? Uh, 14, mm -hmm. I mean, I just dragged to the bottom, so 14 currently. Okay. Well, there's a lot of big pictures in there. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, and it's also, I mean, the, the strikeouts are still taking up space, for example. So, you know, I, I, I'm just being conservative, say 15, 20 pages outside. That seems reasonable. Okay, and we are talking about the Finder OSS Coordinated Disclosure Guide, right? Correct. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to make sure before I ask questions, I'm asking the right questions, which is harder than you might think sometimes. Um, and uh, this is Kayla. I just want to add from the where to re re plant the um, kind of difference between VDP and BBP section. Um, I guess just kind of tooling through this, figuring out where that might fit best. Because right now we still have it just in the brainstorming notes section. Um, so I guess that that's something I'm happy to kind of take a look at. And maybe I'll take a stab at placing it somewhere else, embedding it somewhere else within the document or leaving it as its own section, but just moving it up so that it's it's out of the brainstorming notes area and then totally um, open and, and happy for feedback for where that should go and making sure it's not duplicative because I think it, it still could be a bit duplicative from what we already have up, up top. So that's something I'm happy to take a stab at. Thank you, Kayla. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would make a good section. We already have referenced it at least once in my reading through it, mm -hmm. uh, talking about a bug bounty program. So I think that would be great to have that as a, a section. Probably I would I would put it towards the end, but um, okay. there are other uh, objections or suggestions. Sorry. 
cool. I'm happy to to uh, take a stab at that. Yeah, it's uh, on right now. It's referenced on page five. Okay. Cool. Other comments and ideas. So we arrived at a conclusion about the memes. Uh, I think I'll officially put it uh, as a, a vote uh, to the mailing list. So I would encourage everyone to read your mail. You're going to get two mails from me. Uh, one about a doodle uh, for the SIG, and then I'll do one about the memes so that we can kind of have a group consensus on how we want, would like to, that to go forward. Such a great idea. Thank you for doing that. Welcome. And uh, David, have you, um, in another working group, we were talking about uh, creating exciting and unique pictures. Have you have heard any more information from the, was it the Dolly project? Uh, well, it's, it's open AI. So open AI. Uh, yeah, so quick, quick context. Um, for the fundamentals course on how to develop secure software, we'd like to spice up a little bit, add more pictures. Um, so I asked the OpenAI folks if we could use their Dolly 2. Um, so there's two different answers. One is the, the legal answer and one is the and you have access to tool. Uh, the legal answer from them is yes. Um, you know, if it's uh, freely available, nonprofit, um, you know, they do have some constraints, but I can't believe that, I mean, they don't want violence, they don't want nudity, they don't want individual actual humans' pictures, faces on them. Uh, but I think those are all their requirements are all doable. The bigger problem is access to the, the tool. They run it as a service, and I have I have put into their lists and I have made various uh, requests out to people I know to try to get me in front of the queue, and that's been totally unsuccessful. <laughs> Curses. And, uh, try to get to the head of the line. Curses. Uh, so if somebody knows a, a way to sneak ahead of the line. Uh, you know, and, and knows the secret uh, red carpet uh, handshake. Uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, but I, I do like the idea of uh, trying to use some generated uh, images. If nothing else, they can be interesting. And uh, we do have a graphics uh, department if if you truly, truly want to go that route, but it can get expensive pretty quickly. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, just... Uh... Um, just I might be able I'll might be able to connect with a PhD that works there that um, um, so I'll I'll try if if I'll be able to get through I'll 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 uh, let you know on Slack. Uh, that'd be awesome, and I'll I'll also slap my uh, email address uh, in the chat so you can. <laughs> but so yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know you. Know, even if you're not successful, I would appreciate the effort. So while uh, uh, I think that the idea of using the AI to generate images is interesting from a uh, just entertainment point of view, I think from a functional point of view, what we're going to get are um, our images that are going to allow our readers to scratch their heads and think more about what does this mean and where did it come from and how does it relate to the content then uh, then allow them to engage with the content so um we might it, it might seem easier and more fun to use this shiny new toy but i think it's going to be more effective for our audience who we should always be putting front and center um, to for us to dig through creative commons images and or create diagrams if necessary if uh, relevant to the content than it is to come up with uh shiny new ai generated images i'm sorry to rain on your parade i am the meanest ape in the room and i apologize for that but from an audience perspective i just don't think it's going to be effective i i i would like to be proven wrong you know, I, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I've worked with way too many editors in my life 
for this not to set off red flags? Well, since, since we don't have access to the tool, we have no way to know whether or not we can make it generate ac um, interesting, you know, not just interesting, but uh, useful enough. Uh, what's intriguing about these tools is they don't just say create random arbitrary images, but you give them a text prompt and it creates. Oh, I've seen some prompt. of the output from the text yeah. prompts and yeah. they are hilariously ludicrous in many cases, um, and which is great. And it makes for you know, great uh, social media engagement. And I know that, you know, we're kind of doing the whole airplane. I'm only seeing the things that they find most uh, entertaining and not the stuff that they find to be less entertaining. But um, still from the selection I've seen, I'm not convinced that we're going to get things that aren't head scratching out of it. I, I What I would say is if we get the opportunity, let's try it. Uh, but I also agree with you that since we don't have, and even if we do, we don't know if it'll be successful, we shouldn't depend on that as the one true and only way, because we don't yeah. know if either we'll get access or that we'll, I, I certainly agree with you that many shiny tool, tools don't live up to the hype. Um, so, so uh, you know, ha having an alternative is a good plan. Yeah. Which could be no, no, I mean, there's nothing that says we have to have lots and lots of images, frankly. I'd, I'd rather um, have content. just look at the quality of the images, the ones that are coming out of Imogen, the Google's research, Imogen. Um, I'll send a link to that too. That, those ones like are more realistic and less like, you know, confusing in terms of like their abstract nature. Um, so it, that may those may be more uh, relevant if we're looking for like let's let's punch text in and see if we can get an image out sort of you know it's 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 I think the idea here is like let's expand the range of images that we can find to like satisfy the like content that we're trying to match over like what Creative Commons like pools of images are going to have right like let's let's make that let's give us a, a slightly larger pool of like potential into images we can inject into as content to to help tell the story not like I, th I don't think the goal is like this is this is interesting like let's throw this image in just because it like looks interesting let's throw this image in because it actually like you know it it keeps the engagement or it like gives a visual representation of like what we're trying to communicate and I will say that as we move on to the uh, a future phase of evangelizing our work, I'm all for uh, leveraging yeah, pictures as they are because they, that's very much my style. But um, yeah, we'll we'll see. It, we can we'll let the group uh, weigh in to see what everyone's thoughts are about it. Yeah, it feels like we spent a lot of time talking about images on the call. I'd love to refocus on the content. Um, and see if we can get that in a place where we are really happy with it. Thank you, Crystal. You're my straight woman today. <laughs> uh, let us see. So focusing back on the document. Uh, those that have, are more familiar with it, are there any additional gap areas we think we need to uh, create or find uh, content. I put some suggestions in this morning myself, um, but I'm curious to see what the larger group has to say. Uh, Morton. You uh, can hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Um, so I'd, I haven't been there for a while, so I haven't just started reading through the document now and it looks fine. Uh, there's some thing like there's sort of coordinated disclosures embargoes sort of things and how they're usually dealt with uh, should probably be a bit better explained. Uh, I always like to defer to sort of the Linux distros list and stuff. And they also had the um, recent discussion about how sort of embargo procedures and Linux as a project should sort of be disclosed, which is sort of interesting in this perspective. Um, I also think it's worth probably mentioning what some people should do if they don't have the time to deal with the disclosure themselves, because if some projects are packaged by Linux distributions, some Linux distributions do have uh, CNA teams and 
uh, incident response teams that can uh, sort of take the possible security issue and sort of take and fix it and deal with the disclosure for you. And that's sort of, it's a shortcut and maybe not what you want to focus on, but I think we should probably mention it. But that's sort of the only uh, gaps agree. that I can see. Nice. And that's, um, I put the suggestion in this morning around CNAs of last resort so to start to suss out that idea a little more. Uh, Jonathan. Um, I, Madison and I have been working on other parts of the document. What is the current status of the, so do, um, I can't remember who was working on it. The, um, the difference between VDP and bug bounty program, where is the, is that content currently, is it, what's the state of it? Is there more of it, uh, or is it still being worked on? Um, right now, I believe it's just some notes in the brainstorming section, but uh, Kayla um, said that she might be able to uh, spend some time and get that more fully uh, cheered. Yeah, Crystal and I worked on that and it's, we, at this point, we, the way we wrote it was a little bit more, the style we took was a little bit more bullet, uh, bulleted lists versus a paragraph form. So as I am re fitting it up into the document or where it fits best in the document um i'll probably crystal and i could probably change it around to to help it fit this style that we're going for um but i think the content itself is pretty much pretty much where we're at is is the content that we have in the bottom and uh right now it is under the what brain brainstorming well, it's brainstorming notes section, but um, the content itself is pretty much what we have and we'll just need to be built out in a paragraph form if that even is necessary. Sometimes bulleted lists can be just as professional and easy to follow as well. So it's just about finding the right home for it, really, more than it is, I think, at this point, a super detailed content aspect. Yeah, we were trying to make it easy to read and so people would, uh, you know, consume it quickly, understand it easily. But if we're going for more of a paragraph style, um, yeah, let us know. I think for the document, the paragraph style is what we're going with, but we should consider wherever possible, we should supply templates and checklists. And that's where I think it would be really easy to convert potentially the bullets to a checklist if it adds value to a particular task. Okay, that's great feedback. Love the checklist idea. Uh, Vicki. Yeah, I was gonna suggest the, the checklist idea, but also um, uh, once the document is more or less done, I know like we're just right there. Um, once the document is more or less done, um, I would also recommend that we add a um, max of like half page or something like that executive summary at the top. Um, nobody's gonna read the entire thing, we know that. If they do, we'll be lucky. Um, but condense it down to just the top bit and they're more likely to read that. Right, and then if you need more information, drill down for for that. Uh, and so, like the executive summary, the TLDR, the call it what you all will, but um, just to acknowledge that it will be a long document. We respect your time. Here's the if you can only take away these three things from this document, do these sort of things or five or pick something arbitrary number. I don't care. Um, but I do recommend we do that at the end. I completely agree. I was once admonished by a dear friend of mine uh, that sounds like a uh, paved feeler. And he uh, admonished me for trying to write the introduction before the document. So I, I, we definitely need to have that TLDR at the top one, once we're all done or closer to being finished. Jonathan. I on the on the um, VDP versus bug bounty program. I don't know what it, so a checklist is like the, the I don't know if the checklist is quite appropriate here because you're not like as a as a person who's finding a vulnerability report, you're not checking off a list of things that you're like getting you know 
Um, but I that, think that particular piece, it might not be, but right. there are other areas where checklists could be helpful right. as additional material. Right. Um, I maybe for that a like side by side comparison might be a better con, right? Like, what is the VDP? What is the bugbounder program? I do want to um, make sure that we include in this document like a very explicit warning um, to, and I don't know how to communicate this, like maybe like a, a, a banner warning, whatever. But but you know, as have as I have experienced a lot, especially with bug bounty programs run by HackerOne and BugCrowd, is that the, the default template that people end up rolling with includes a, an NDA. And so like, you know, an explicit warning of, hey, if you're encountering a vulnerability disclosure program or a bug bounty program, before you disclose, make sure that you're not unintentionally agreeing to a non-disclosure agreement about the vulnerability you're disclosing when you're dealing with vulnerabilities in open source. Um, and like making that like an, an, a, an explicit apparent, like here there be dragons, like be careful before you play this game sort of thing, or like read, read carefully when you're going through that before you submit your vulnerability. You need to remember that our primary stakeholder in this is trying to support and improve the open source ecosystem and maintainers. So we need to be very careful about how we word things and try to remain neutral. Bug bounty programs are a valid option and some projects elect to do that. It is not common practice right we need to be very measured in how we state that but yeah we absolutely could put i'm not uh, i'm not disagreeing type with of that. language yeah. around this is something a reporter should be aware of right yeah it's not about like I, I, bug bounty programs are wonderful right it's about the nda that it gets associated like the, the nda being the problem around like uh, enforcing like you can't just you disclose a vulnerability to this program you can't you it's not allowed to be public afterwards right because a lot of stuff in open source requires a CD before it, or as a part of the disclosure to actually get it to the end users to, to get them fixed, right? I'm running this in, into this issue with the Amazon security team where they're like, you know, hey, like we've never handled this before. Like we'd love to support you, but we've not, you know, we've not, we don't normally do vulnerability disclosure and our our program for handling this stuff is it has an NDA. And I'm like, can you give me a waiver then? Right, like you, like I'm happy, you know, I'd, lo I'd love a bounty out of this, but like you, you gotta give me a waiver on your not NDA because this needs to get disclosed and it needs a CDE number. I think we discussed this in, in prior call um, and the consensus was that that's a, not a prevalent issue in kind of open source software. Um, I know you're giving the Amazon example and I think you gave a Netflix, ex Netflix example before, but I think with the audience being open source, I, I have it, 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 it's the it's a common issue when you are disclosing a security vulnerability to a corporate entity that run that manages an open source project. It is it is common in that context. It is not common to open source in general, but as soon as you are dealing with a corporate entity that owns an open source project, it is a common thing to to encounter in that context. Can you provide some examples? Uh, Netflix, I've run into this issue with Amazon, Expedia, um, uh, the Expedia, Hotels.com. Like this is these are cases that I concrete examples of like cases that I've run into this where you report a vulnerability. For example, Expedia, they had a security at email address. You report the vulnerability to the, to the security at email address. They send you an email back saying, "Great, we've got a bug bounty program with Hacker One." They send you a ticket back and they and they say and then you go to the hacker one link and you read the vdp that they have and the vdp has a non-disclosure agreement and so then you're if you if you don't read the dis, actually i ended up disclosing first because you get when you when you got the email back you get greeted with the form of here fill in the vulnerability details here after you've hit submit then you can see the vdp details and you realize that you've just submitted to an nda based program right so Yes, I have I, I have firsthand experience with this exact problem. And it, it's 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 common when you're dealing with these with with these. It's not I've talked to Alex Rice, right? And and I've talked to um uh uh what's his name who runs uh bug crowds, he's the CTO of Bug Crowd. Um and they're like, that's not the way it should work. And I'm like, I agree that's not the way it should work. Like that's not the way we want these things to work, but it's the way that these programs have ended up getting stood up, stood up by the legal teams that have worked with these, these security teams to establish them. And you have to challenge them. You have to say, no, there is not gonna be an NDA in this. 
Like that's an explicit step that has to go into this. And it's annoying. It, it, it really annoys me. Like I, it's not part of the game that I want to play, but it's something you have to consider because it's like, otherwise you end up like, you know, in a case where you're like, well, you disclose the vulnerability, but you're not allowed to, just, you, you, we can't, we're not going to let you publicly disclose it. It's like, that's, 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 you know, you're not protecting users and the company gets to, to hide, hide their dirty laundry. Jeffrey, you had a statement or comment? Yeah, I think that we won't solve this complex challenge on this call today, but I did want to, you know, basically voice support for further investigation on this because I do think it's a legitimate concern. There's also an inherent um, cultural conflict, maybe is a one way to think about it, between how a enterprise would view this versus how a community would view this. And then lastly, as it relates uh, to this issue, um, you know, part of the justification for an NDA might be to you know, hide the quote unquote dirty laundry, but the other element of that is the idea of ethical disclosure and that you don't want to, um, part of the reason for an NDA is that it's very important for a, especially a business entity to get the timing of the disclosure correct because of the desire to minimize the potential blast radius. And I'll step back. Uh, Jennifer. Um, just uh, kind of briefly in support of Jonathan's point, um, I've done hundreds of disclosures in the last few years and uh, there's definitely an uptick in people being routed through um, uh, bug bounty platforms, even when they're not engaging in bug bounty. Um, in fact, like the disclosures that we're typically doing are explicitly not wanting a bounty because usually there's a client, client conflict for us anyway. And even then, there are certain teams and there's been a large number of them that will only receive these reports through the bounty platform, which does have legal agreements that are different than we're used to. So it's worthy of consideration even outside of the scope of bug bounty. And I just want to mention that. Thank you. And again, I'm not uh, backing the idea. I'm just stating we need to be as neutral and fact-based and uh, unemotional as we can. It's clearly stating the facts around what uh, could, might or might not be within scope. Uh, Jonathan. Um, Jeffrey, to respond to your point, um, one of the long-term issues that has occurred in vulnerability disclosure is this idea of including ethics in the topic of vulnerability disclosure. Um, there, the end result of a several years of this discussion has resulted in the term responsible disclosure kind of being dropped as a term being used in common discourse about this topic because ethics and responsible disclosure if, if you want to think about it from the perspective of the researcher or the per, like it's it's the the organization that wrote the vulnerability in the first place that is that and didn't test it adequately that is ethically in the in the wrong for having released a piece of software without adequately testing it right so there's this whole like ethics component about like and and it all has to do with perspective and so the 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 way that the industry has moved has been let's move towards coordinated disclosure where a researcher and the organization decide about how the vulnerability disclosure is gonna occur. And then that's how it flies. Um, I personally, and, and I, I follow Google's vulnerability disclosure policy. So that's 90 days. And if you don't have a fix out in 90 days, it's going public no matter what, right? Google does that same thing. And uh, so establishing these sets of norms are important. And the reason behind that, especially for Google, is that they had a long history of vulner reporting vulnerabilities as Project Zero and having nobody actually fix them in a timely manner until they instituted a 90-day disclosure timeline. And as soon as they instituted a 90-day disclosure timeline, they started seeing many of their vulnerabilities get fixed within that time frame, right? Um, and so uh, the, the like morality and ethics are subjective and it's difficult it's a it is a difficult topic to to have in this context but the 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 facts that google, the, the like the statistics that google has gathered around this having done vulnerability disclosure for a long time is saying that disclosure is an important component of this because it and especially with with enforced timeline disclosure because it actually in, gets these vulnerabilities fixed in a timely manner and thanks for that uh additional uh clarification because i i do agree no, nothing precipitates action like an impending event. 
Um, final words, Matt. Yeah, I, I think ethics goes both ways. Um, not all people who report vulnerabilities are altruistic. I experienced firsthand in, in the Apache Foundation of my project that we a, a, comp, a, a person who's starting a new company withheld vulnerabilities until we, we produced a first release of a, of, a, of a project there. So we have, you know, we need to bear in mind that, you know, perhaps some agreements need to be made with people submitting vulnerabilities that they don't profit or, or do these things to disincentivize people from doing these holding back vulnerabilities, basically, uh, to, to advantage themselves or, or some, some IPO or whatever they're, they're, they're doing. <laughs> The easiest way to do vulnerability disclosure is drop it on pub, drop it in the public, throw it on Twitter, right? The, the that doesn't easiest, necessarily serve. It's not the best thing. No, 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 no. I agree. One hundred percent. Drop it. But I'm saying it's like they should be disincentivized by saying when you report it. You, the, I'm saying there might be a need for some agreement. You, you know, we don't like it because people hold them back. I'm saying that it goes both ways. So people are holding back vulnerabilities because they're going to profit from it. <laughs> but so but vulner, if, vulnerability. If we could, yeah, if yeah. we could focus our thoughts and put them into the document that we can yes. kind of articulate, um, iterate over them there. Um, this is a good conversation. I appreciate everyone's passion on the topic. And we will talk to everyone uh, in two weeks. And you'll see two emails from me very soon. And please focus your energy in uh, writing the con your ideas down. And we can figure out the best way that this group can uh, get that out and shared with the world. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.